welcome everyone. I'd like to introduce you to Kevin Abarbanel, uh, good friend. I've known him for almost 30 years now. Uh, met him uh, prior to becoming an interest rate trader on the floor in Montreal. Um, Kevin is one of the preeminent um, market makers in short-term interest rates in Canada. We're going to get into um, what he does on a daily basis, how he started, all of that. I want to introduce you to a new series that I'm going to be doing on a monthly basis. And I thought, you know, with uh, a lot of uh, hype about what's happening in interest rates and, you know, the need for our clients and people to know, uh, I thought, what what better than to have my good friend and one of the best traders in Canada on to talk about what's happening in Canadian interest rates, in U.S. interest rates and how to price them and what's happening, you know, currently by the Bank of Canada. So welcome, Kevin. I appreciate you uh, joining me today. I know you're busy. Um, mm-hmm. We truly appreciate your time. So I, I, I just wanted to ask, like, I know because, you know, I did this with you and I actually worked for you many, many years ago. But how did you uh, give us your background, how you got started and, you know, trading interest rates? It's not a job that, uh, you know, many people strive to do or look, look to do. How did you get started? And uh, thanks again for joining yeah my pleasure thank you for having me um yeah i started um fresh out of uh, university i did my bachelor's degree in finance and um uh at the time that i was finishing up my degree in my fourth year i guess my third or fourth year i became very interested in <clears throat> derivative products and i did some fourth year research work uh on uh uh, futures and derivatives in the Canadian market, uh, but at the time, uh, it was really a market that was dominated by um, uh, the U.S. It was quite obscure. The derivatives market it was quite obscure in Canada. So one thing led to another, and that led me to uh, get a job with uh, a brokerage house that uh, was called Burns Fry on the floor of the Montreal Exchange. And the Montreal Exchange, so this would have been 1993, the Montreal Exchange was um, a huge trading floor where half of the floor was uh, different firms and people trading in stocks, and the other half was uh, uh, people trading in bond derivatives, um, which are essentially um, futures and options contracts on bonds. They're like proxies for the actual underlying bonds. So I started to work for Burns Fry and... Uh, Shortly after I was working for Burns Fry, they were they were purchased by uh, Bank of Montreal, and so uh, I worked for Bank of Montreal. I was Bank of Montreal's uh, head trader on the floor in in short term interest rates. So from basically from uh, three month uh, instruments out to about two years, and um, I worked in the trading pit. Uh, I worked on the phones as well. Uh, I uh, had the privilege of um, uh, executing orders for Bank of Montreal's institutional clients. And at the same time, the bank allocated to me a certain amount of capital to trade their own capital in those markets. Uh, and so I did that for about four years. And then uh, I essentially decided to go and do it for myself. Uh, so I left the bank and I started my own firm uh, called Ebb and Flow Trading, which I, which I still own and operate today. And I started to trade uh, the same products that I was for the bank, which are short-term interest rate futures. And uh, to this day, I still do the same thing, except for now everything is electronic. The floors don't exist anymore. Right. So I guess, um, you know, my background was the interest rates as well. Um, I guess we met in 1997, so we're coming up on almost 30 years. Mm -hmm. We met on a vacation, you know, at a mutual friend's place on vacation. Uh, And uh, I basically came down to work for you, I think, almost not not long after you went on your own. I I, I Mm -hmm. went to him. You know, I slept on a couch for a few weeks and shacked up with a couple buddies. And that's how I got into it, learning from you and, and actually being an executing broker for you. So... Uh, just for our viewers at the time, and um, you've probably seen the video that, you know, the entrance video to this, uh, we were doing this, 
you know, and open outcry pits, which don't really exist anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, we both went to start trading on the computer, I guess, what was that, 2000 or 2001? Yeah, the floor closed at the, in December of 2000, so essentially 2001, yeah. Right, so 2001, when computerized, we traded, I traded your book for a bit, you started a firm, uh, you had traders working for you, plus doing your own thing. Um, I guess what what was the difference? You know, we'll get into you know what you're trading and how you're trading it. But what was the difference between doing it, you know, on the floor and then doing it when it went to computers? Right. Um, well, it's almost like there's the differences are so stark that it's almost completely you know different. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, but being on the floor was you know super physical, very aggressive. Uh, Right. Uh, you had to be super, super fast, uh, and uh, you had to, uh, you know, sort of protect your territory and and uh, and <laughs> and make sure that you were getting what you needed to get done. Uh, and you know, when things went on screen, uh, you know, you're you're uh, all of a sudden, you know, the, the the trading space became overtaken with technology and and. Right. and uh, uh, those with superior technical, uh, it, it basically became more of a um, programmer's <laughs> place than a trader's place. Right. Uh, uh, in, just in the early years, you know, because, you know, the latency and the speed of your connection to the exchange servers facilitated quicker order entry and stuff like that. So there was a, a, probably like a one or two year period where it was an arms race between all the banks uh, and brokerage houses to see who could who could get their fastest computers going. But once that uh, ended, um, it w reverted back to becoming a you know a place where people traded and and, and bought and sold things and um, and uh, just became I guess more um, more challenging I guess uh, to to make money from my perspective, but. Um, we found different ways and uh, we're still doing it. I'm still doing it. So. Right, right. And I guess in, I mean, I know this, but in between we had a, a decade of decreasing interest rates that also became yes. became more, you know, yeah. became tougher to, to make a spread as interest rates started. To I mean, when I started in 93 uh, on the floor, the three month rates in Canada were eight and a half percent. And essentially from 1993 until just recently they went straight you know down to almost zero from eight nine percent to zero and in 2022 this is the first time that that, that we that i'm seeing them you know creeping back up into the you know five percent area you know right i think when i quit or stopped trading that product and became a mortgage broker rates were at zero like i i felt the same thing i mean i started yes. in 97 Rates went to almost zero, became incredibly hard and competitive, and uh, became more of a patient man's game to to make markets and make a little bit of money. Right? Absolutely. I mean, we lived through we lived through the genesis uh, of the modern monetary theory, which you know, really Bernanke, Ben Bernanke, the former Fed chair, was the the father of that. This idea that you know, uh, you just lower rates and lower rates and lower rates as a way to avert recessions and depressions right um and uh, it, it it trans it, it transpired and before our very eyes you know right. so okay. i think guys our age that were working on the floor and in the markets in those days were uh there's not too many of us still around that saw that you know happen. sure sure so uh why don't you talk about what it is you're trading exactly and how you know you do it in the day in the life of, of kevin of Arbino. yeah so uh, i think for your viewers just to sort of set the table a little bit the the um the derivatives market especially the futures markets are all based on uh, commodities that are um sorry i'm getting some trading, trading. Here. okay i have no way of muting that so i apologize That's okay. um uh, the commodities markets, the futures markets are always based on major commodities. So um, the earliest futures markets were on the agricultural commodities like uh, wheat and corn and soybean and 
orange juice. And then, uh, you know, in the late seventies, we started to see commodities on, uh, on metals like gold and silver. And shortly thereafter, they started to make futures on financial assets, financial commodities that are in high demand. So like 10 year bonds, two year bonds and short interest rates. So I trade in the bond futures markets, which are just uh, futures markets on fixed income products. And the space is really, really dominated by big institutions. It's not uh, like the stock market would be a place where you have a lot of speculators, uh, retail investors, um, hedge funds. There's all types of uh, different people that are playing in that market. But the futures market is really an institutional market. There's very few people like myself that are uh, navigating in those waters um, because primarily because the institutions have an edge in that they're dealing in the underlying commodity. Right. So they have, you know, a little bit of an insight into into pricing, you know. Right. But my day to day is essentially um, so I, I trade the um, short term interest rate markets. So essentially, uh, the markets from uh, what we call cash, which is like overnight lending that the the bank central banks do, to about two years. It's a massive, massive market. Uh, the by far the biggest players are the major Canadian and U.S. banks. They probably account for you know. 75% of all activity. And then there's uh, guys like me, then there's algorithmic firms that are in there. Uh, and essentially what we're trying to do is uh, make markets for the banks. When the banks come in and they want to hedge off some risk or, or execute a trade for one of their clients, we're there to provide liquidity for them. And, um, you know, we take a, we take a, well, we try to make a cut between the bid and the offer. Okay. Uh, and that's essentially what we're doing all day. We, 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 we try to be, or at least myself and most of the people I know that do what I do, we try to be what we call like a opinionless. We don't, we're not ever, you know, super bearish or bullish or try to make calls one way on the market. We just really facilitate transactions. And uh, because we're, we're there every day, all the time, we, we can price things uh, very efficient. Right. Okay. So can we talk about, I guess, what's changed? Because I know this has changed in the last few years where, you know, in Canada, at least, they were dominated by the six big players and CDOR and LIBOR. And how, how, how are these markets priced? And, and what do you do when you come in every day? And what are you looking at? Right. So I think the, uh, the main important thing for people to understand is that the central banks, whether it's the Bank of Canada or the Federal Reserve in the U.S. or the ECB in Europe, they don't they don't try to control the interest rates at different durations along the yield curve, like the ten year yields or the five year or the thirty year. They control the the uh, the interest rates by simply their overnight lending okay. and how they lend. And the central banks only lend to to um, uh, what we call dealers or schedule one banks. So there's very few um, banks. They have to be really, really big that can deal directly with the central banks. And by the central bank setting their policy to wh where they deal with these banks, it basically cascades out through the financial system, through the fixed income markets. And the central bank controls that with their overnight uh, lending rate. Right. And so... Uh, Traditionally, that was done by um, where the banks would, uh, where the central bank would just lend money to the Schedule One banks, who would then uh, get it out into the system. But uh, the main banks were found to have; they were using um, these benchmarks. So the main benchmark across the world was called LIBOR, the London Interbank Offered Rate, and in Canada it was called CDOR. And every day, these banks would quote where they saw their rates for one month money, three month money, six months, so on and so forth. And these quotes would be used as benchmarks for all other activities in the fixed income market. And, uh, you know, unfortunately the banks were found, especially in LIBOR, there was a huge um, settlement where uh, the, the major banks across the word, world were found to be involved in some price fixing with these benchmarks. 
And that precipitated essentially a massive overhaul in the system that occurred about two, three years ago, where um, almost all of the G7, uh, including Canada, went to uh, a new system for trying to determine a benchmark overnight lending rate from the bank of from the central bank, which is based on what we call repo. And repo is really um, it's like the plumbing system of of the of the financial markets. Uh, it's it, it, you know if your house is like you know your foundation is important, but your plumbing is the thing that makes everything work, or your electrical systems would make everything works. The repo market is what makes all markets work: mortgage markets, corporate lending, uh, private lending, because. The repo market is where the central bank will lend to other banks, but it has to be collateralized. Okay. So, so uh, and and the term repo comes from you uh, you lend if you borrow money. Like let's say you let's say I'm the central bank and you want to borrow money, so you'll say, okay, uh, uh, Mr. Macklin at Bank of Canada, I need fifty million dollars of overnight money. I will give you the 50 million of overnight money, but you have to give me some kind of collateral okay. in the form of government of Canada issued debt that I take away from you as collateral. I give you my 50 million. And whenever you pay me back, you repossess your bonds and I give them back to you. Okay. So similar in the way that, you know, similar in the way that, um, that when you, when an individual takes out a mortgage from a bank like bank of Montreal, their house is collateral. Right. Right. And yeah. if they don't pay that money back, the bank will repossess the house. Yeah. It's the same thing, right? Yeah. So what happened is now overnight or during a day, there's all there's there's in Canada, there's about twenty billion dollars of repo transactions that go on between the different banks amongst themselves, the banks with the central bank, and they take all of those trades during one day and they look at them all and they say, What's the weighted average? Of all of those trades, what's the what's the what's the interest rate? And the interest rate that all those trades will be done at will be reported the next day, and it'll always fall between the Bank of Canada's higher and lower band of where they want those trades to happen. Okay. And so we're living now in a world of really, really great transparency where the central bank can really control the level of interest rates. Yep. And uh, not only do they control level interest rates, but they publish to the public every day at 9 a.m. what that daily repo rate is. Okay. And so there's no goofing around and, and uh, you know, nefarious stuff going on on the sides, right? So right now, I mean, I know this, the, the, the rate is what, between 5 and 520? Yeah. So the lower band is 5 and the higher band is 525. And if something gets out of whack, then the, the central bank comes in to make sure that things... Yeah, so essentially, if there's, let's say there's a lender, let's say someone has a lot of money and they want, and they're willing to, they can't find anyone to lend the money to. And so uh, they, uh, they, they say, they call up a counterpart and they'll say, I'm willing to lend it at 495 because I can't find anyone to lend it to. What impedes them from doing that is they can pick up the phone and call the central bank and say, I'll give you, I'll lend you my money. Yeah. And the central bank will give them 5%. Okay. So they protect the lower band and they do the same thing on the upper band at 525. Right. So it's always in between that, that rate. And, and by that, they really, really rigidly can control the level of interest rates on a, on a, a day-to-day -day basis and everything else from that flows out. Right. Because, banks are constantly having to do balance sheet transactions sure. uh, with the central bank. So, you know what I mean? Uh, right. So they so so every major players playing in this space and they're doing it for their own books. They're doing it for big corporations. There's only a certain amount of players, Canadian. There's players. about 14 dealers in Canada. Okay. That report with the bank of Canada. Okay. Plus the one yeah. in the U S I guess. Uh, well, the ones in the U.S. Will, would use would Which would yeah. There's yeah. a few of them, I'm sure, like J.P. Morgan and Morgan Stanley and, and Citigroup that can deal directly with the Bank of Canada. Okay. All right. Yeah. So why don't you talk about this? Is all interesting. Why don't you talk about what your daily? You know, what are you yeah, doing so on a daily? Essentially, day? daily, I'm looking at the um, the different repo rates. Uh, 
uh, depending on duration. So I'll look at like. Uh, Can you, you share know, a screen and show us like what that looks like? Yeah, yeah, I will. Um, so actually, just before I do that, I'll just quickly show you because I think your your uh, viewers might be interested in in this. Um, just give me one second. Okay, so I'll first share with you. Can you see the screen here? Yeah, it's coming okay. up now. Yep. Okay, so this screen here is the actual uh, Bank of Canada, what the Bank of Canada publishes at nine o'clock every day. Okay. So if you follow my cursor out here to this date, uh, April the third. Yeah. Okay. You'll see. So this is the rate. This was the. This is the. The five hundred two is the average repo rate that was done yesterday. Yeah. And you can see the volume. It's twenty three. Uh, twenty three point seven billion dollars worth of money was sloshed around the Canadian banking system yesterday. Yeah. And you can see all these different rates. The lowest rate that people did at was 5%, and the highest was 504. Okay. And the average is 502. Okay. So essentially, it just, um, it just, um, this is what I'm looking at. So everyone looks at this every morning to get a sort of gauge of where things are trading. And then um, I'll share my trading screen with you now. And before it was kind of run, it was called CEDAR in Canada, it was run. Yeah, before, before it didn't matter what the Bank of Canada, uh, didn't matter what the, um, where the banks were, were transacting with the Bank of Canada, they would just publish every day the rates where they thought, uh, where the rates should be at different duration points along the yield curve. So at one month and three months and six months, they would say, oh, we think they should be 505. We think they should be 510. But they weren't liable for those quotes. Right. They were just, they were just, um, they were just, you know, uh, quoting, and it, it just wasn't as rigorous of a, um, of a, 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 of a metric, you know, to measure the true. Uh, so I'm going to show you now. This is my trading screen. Yeah, one of my trading screens, and. Um, so what you'll see here in the right hand, in the, in the top left hand corner, this is just a five minute chart of the Canadian 10 year bond. Yeah. So essentially, uh, as I've explained before, the, the overnight lending rate between the central banks and the main banks that surround them is really the main, it's like sort of the heartbeat of the system. And then if you go out to the 10 year bonds, the 10 year bonds of any country is the next really really big pricing point it's where a lot of people like to transact uh, it's a it's a point on the curve where there's a tremendous amount of of need uh, pension funds insurance companies major institutions are out in a 10-year because it allows them to offset liabilities um, the, you know that are on longer duration yeah. so anyway so the 10-year we always look at and i know you know this but all fixed income guys constantly stare at the 10 year bonds to yeah. see where we're going. So that's just an active chart. It's not moving around right now too much. Yeah. And then all of these, what we call trading ladders yeah. are actually uh, uh, short term interest rate futures uh, contracts, but for different months. So this, the, where my mouse is, is this is the month of June. This is the month of September. This is the spread between the two of them. And this down here where my uh, mouse is, is the March. Yeah. And these all represent the overnight repo rate where people think it'll be in the future. Right. So in these markets on everyday basis, you have all the major, major U.S. and Canadian banks. They're the main guys that are here. Yeah. And they're executing buy and sell orders for their clients. They're using these products for themselves to hedge risk. And they essentially will use these products uh, to uh, to offset balance sheet risk that they feel, or maybe even um, you know make a make a call on where the bank might what might be the bank's next policy move. 
They use them for different reasons, but essentially they're used more for hedging than anything. Right. And I will basically um, work with them and uh, essentially try to anticipate where they want to go, whether they're buyers or sellers. Uh, and at different times of the day, they could be a buyer. At different times, it could be a seller. And so I will uh, essentially navigate in these markets. Um, like you can see down here in March, yep. all these these numbers here on the side are my orders that are live in the market. Okay. And uh, the rest of the of the numbers represents other participants like myself who are trying to buy, and here they're trying to sell. Yeah. And everything is anchored by movements in the ten-year bond up here. Yep. And movement in the shorter shorter rate markets like uh, like the two-year bonds. Uh, this is the uh, two-year bonds right here, down here in the corner. So you're essentially looking at. Um, all of these different uh, pricing points along the yield curve. You're trying to get a feel for ways that banks are moving and they don't always move in, in, in congruent fashion. Often there's two or three banks that are sellers, two or three that are buyers. And, you know, you kind of have to try to, um, to figure out where you want to step in and you, you don't have to step in anywhere really right. if you want to. And so you're uh, providing, a little bit of extra liquidity for the banks. And in turn, there's an opportunity sometimes for you to make a little money by providing them a little bit of, of uh, a, an offer or, you know, buy yeah. or sell it, yeah. right? Yeah. And also, and also the banks are in here for their clients and they're trying to, uh, they're trying to benefit from uh, the proper uh, speculative call on, what might be the Bank of Canada's next policy move. And uh, because I'm an insider too, and I follow the market in depth, uh, I can do the same thing too. Right, right. So, so uh, correct on my own behalf and say, well, I think the bank is going to do this. And I think the bank is going to do that. So I'm going to position myself accordingly. Yeah. Right. Okay. So correct me if I'm wrong at the bottom left there, we have the March contract. Looks like it's trading around 5%. Yeah. Right. So right. ninety four ninety nine. Uh, you the the uh, the math behind it is you do one hundred minus this number because this is the price number. Yeah. To get the yield, so one hundred minus ninety four ninety nine is five hundred one. Which right? coincides. And, and we, just saw, we just saw that the bank's rate. Uh, yeah. Yesterday was five hundred two. Right. So the March contract, which is a forward, it's a three month forward from March, so it predicts where prices will be in March in May, in June, and right up until, sorry, in March and April and in May, right up to the beginning of June, the market's predicting that the rates will be exactly the same as what they are now. Right, so if we go up towards the the, the ladder next to the bond chart, no. that's June. That that's June, be, so that's June, June, but three months forward, forward after June, so July, August, September, and if you do 100 minus 95.22, you get a 4.78 rate. And so the market's predicting that the Bank of Canada's overnight repo rate will be at 4.78 in the beginning of September, which is one, which is about 25 basis points lower than where it is now. Right. So there's a high probability. It's not 100 percent, but a high probability that sometime after June to September, there'll be a cut. Yeah, twenty-five. Well, that's what the market is predicting. That's what they're. It doesn't. But, it's going to happen. But the markets market could be wrong. Could be whatever. Absolutely, the market. Too, you know, uh, you know, a month and a half ago was predicting in this same, in this same contract here that there would be two quarterly. Uh, I remember that and quarter I, basis point. I remember too. talking to you about it. You thinking that was not. Yeah. So case. this is even. You know, this is even a product. Uh, you know, where obviously it's a bit too sophisticated for the layman but you know even if you uh you know let's say you were thinking of you know your mortgage is coming due uh, in 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 late summer and uh you know you want to take advantage of you know you're going to renew your mortgage and you want to make sure that you hedge this off you could use this product to guarantee yourself at least a 25 basis point lower rate right I on your mortgage you know okay and then next to it we have what is that september that's september so september uh, goes out uh it the september contract predicts where prices will be in december 
So if you do 100 minus 95.48, you get a 452 rate, right? which is a full 50 basis points lower than where the bank is today. Right. So essentially the Canadian, the Canadian futures markets, these markets, which are the most liquid markets uh, in the short end in Canada, are saying that in the third quarter, the bank will ease rates by 25 basis points. And then in the fourth quarter, they'll do it again. They'll ease again by 25. Right. And, and you and I have had many conversations over drinks and right. you know, cigars and things like that. And I know you pushed back on the narrative that there were going to be many rate cuts. And it looks like you, mm -hmm. you've been proven correct. But at one point, mm -hmm. I guess even a month ago, we, yeah. we probably saw 100 basis points by the mm -hmm. end of the year. And, and that's been yeah. pushed back based on what? That's based on Tiff McClem and, and uh, Chairman Powell. Um, you know, still being reluctant because of inflation not coming down quite as quickly as they'd like? Yes, for, for the most part. I think that they're, um, uh, well, first of all, both their mandates are to have inflation at 2%. Right. And they're, you know, both in Canada and the States, they're, you know, a little bit north of three. Yeah. You know, they haven't even gotten, they haven't even got it to 2% yet. So, uh Normally, they wouldn't ease policy until that would happen. Yeah, uh, but also the economies have been both quite strong. Uh, uh, they yeah. thought that they thought um, that they would, um, you know, really, really dampen demand with these rate increases. And I suppose they have to a certain extent. But GDP is still a fairly strong. Uh, the labor market is very strong, which is probably the, the single biggest vector that's causing them to not ease rates is that uh, the labor market is tight. Yeah. The tightness in the labor market is leading to um, increase in wages, which eventually leads to continuing increases in inflation. So uh, I think that both, uh, uh, well, I'll talk about Canada because I'm assuming most of your clients are Canadian, that in Canada, you know, he, he's staring at a situation where GDP is strong, the labor market is tight, uh, demand is not really decreasing, and so there's no real imperative to decrease rates, you know? Right, right. Can you talk about, the, you know, I know, I, I kind of know this, but, you know, the, the order flow on each side of those ladders. So in Canada, you know, on any given order, what is that? Like, what's the size of uh, notion? Yeah, so, so you saw from the previous... Um, government of canada webpage that the actual cash that's being sloshed around in a day is about uh 20 billion dollars yeah so each one of these uh where my mouse is this is the uh, size on the bids and offers yeah every one is a million every one contract is worth a million dollars of underlying overnight repo so here you have basically 1.7 trillion uh uh, worth of buyers and you have 2.3 trillion worth of sellers and the reason why those numbers are so significantly bigger than uh, the uh, actual cash transactions that happen during the day is that for each million dollars that you expose yourself to here you only have to put up about a thousand dollars okay right because this is these are these are again these are the the actual rate itself so there's not a huge amount of volatility in these yeah. rates. So you can put on larger size trades, um, but they're fantastic products for institutions, major institutions to be able to hedge off huge chunks of risks on their balance sheet. Right, and you have, a, I think, a US one up there, and what would be the difference between... You know, oh yeah, let me show you the US. So this sure. is the, uh, so this here is the June Canadian market and yeah. this is the this over here is the june us market and you can see the difference in size so here on the offer you have um 55 trillion offered at a certain interest rate and right. here you have 2.2 trillion so our overnight repo market is 20 ish billion yeah so what would be the overnight in the states Two trillion a night, a Two day. Two trillion a day, basically. Of cash. Of, of cash, cash. Just cash. around. Yeah. Just being short, 
lend it out yeah. short term and on whatever. Right. Right. right, right. But you know, if you're if you're a bank and if you're a bank in Canada, let's say, and you have a, a, a you know, I don't know, you know, five hundred million on your books that you're not sure, you know, what whether you're going to originate mortgages with it, and you just want to hedge off the interest rate, you can come in this market right here, and you can buy or sell five hundred contracts. And you could completely hedge your interest rate risk until such time as you're actually going to use the money. Right. So that's why these markets are absolutely dominated by the banks. Like at the end of the day, when I look at all the different trades that I do, who who I'm trading against, ninety percent of the trades are against, you know, Bank of Montreal, uh, Scotia, Citigroup in the states, uh, Morgan Stanley in the states, J.P. Morgan in the states. Royal Bank here in Canada, it's all banks, you know? right? Because it's such a beautiful product for them to be able to just hedge off risk all the time, right? You know? Right, so we're basically seeing 50 basis points, give or take. We're on, we're filming this on April 4th, yeah, uh, April 5th, tomorrow. There's jobs numbers, yeah. Uh, I think uh, you and I both agree that you know the Fed and Bank of Canada are pr probably data dependent now. We've had a few yeah. data points that, you know, showed us that rates might go much lower and then we get converse data points and rates go back up a bit. We've seen that over the last couple of weeks for sure. So I guess, you know, for our viewers tomorrow, if we get soft jobs numbers, then maybe some of this might change a little Absolutely. bit. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. And then we'll get a bank meeting this month. Right. Is the bank meeting uh, next Wednesday? Next yeah. Wednesday, uh, April tenth. Yeah. Right, and we don't anticipate anything. No. Um, I know you told me you went to see Tiff McClem speak last week. Yeah. Uh, and he's been pretty resolute that you know inflation is the number one concern, and yeah. while rates probably are not going to go up anymore, he's not really ready just yet to. Yeah. Lower. I think. I think. I mean, you know things change and this is obviously a very dynamic space where economic data and economic conditions can radically change central bank policy pretty quickly but i think what he's been not only what i heard in montreal but really what he's been saying at the end of his meetings and his press conferences and, and him and his deputy carolyn rogers have been going around the country are really beating the drum of what they're they they feel like part of the affordability issues in canada in real estate were exacerbated by the years of low low interest rates right. where um you know just the facility to get to have access to funds created you know dramatic increase in prices which filters into rents and everything right and so although they acknowledge that um having high rates you know and having high mortgage rates contributes to inflation they feel that it's sort of bringing um real estate a little bit more into balance right you know? and right. so i don't think that they're gonna rush to lower rates unless we go into an economic downturn right you know right right and and i mean there's been some i guess they call them macro prudential stuff they've been working on last week i think it was last week they talked about a loan to income on portfolios with the big banks, they're implementing something first quarter of 2025. Right. That coinciding with lower rates probably keeps a lid on massive appreciation in real estate. It's probably coinciding with where and when they think that rates might, you know, start to really drop. Right. That's right. And they're also they're also in February they started a mortgage back. Uh, Central bank is buying mortgage back bonds from CMHC which is supportive to uh, a certain segment of the housing market. So they're trying to, they're trying to help the housing market. And then at the same time, they're trying to, you know, keep it a little bit cooled, you know? Right. Uh, so makes sense worth, you know, not even if they may have an inkling to drop rates, maybe not do it in the spring market when things are usually bullish in real estate push it back to when people are going back to school and real estate's a little bit quiet. Yeah. And if rates start to really go lower, 
you know, end of the year, yeah. first quarter of 2025. Yeah. If there's some yeah. limit. Well, I, I, think, I think that if you see, I think that if you see inflation, I think there's a, there's there's not, there's multiple different things that could cause them to ease quicker than people think. One is if inflation does revert quickly back to 2%, uh, I think that they would ease their rates. I think if the job market started to show cracks, they would ease their rates, but it would take a few numbers in a row. Right. You know, right. It's not just going to be one number. Right. You know, uh, so I do think that the next move will be an ease. It's just a question of when, you know. Right, right. And um, you don't think that... Uh, I mean, are you betting on status quo? Are you, do you have any thoughts yourself on, like, on you know, on this? Or are you just kind of playing, you know, just to 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 make orders and like? I think know? that I think that my my sort of baseline thesis is that um, uh, the you know we 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 you and I talked about this that uh, the number one predictor for. Uh, a recession, a forthcoming recession, uh, it is historically a 100% accuracy is when the yield curve inverts between two years and 10 years, right. which means that the yield on the two years are higher than the 10 years. Yeah. It's traditionally it's lower. That happened in 2022, and everyone was saying, we're going to go into a recession for sure. That yield curve is still inverted, and we're not even close to a recession right and so everyone's sort of scratching their head saying how how could they raise how could they have raised rates 500 basis points in such a short period of time and it's not really affecting economic output and uh, myself and some other people you know are starting to say well maybe it's because of the fiscal spending of the governments yeah we've had many of those conversations they're spending in that, and not only in Canada but in the US too it's, yeah. they're just spending you know really out of control yeah and so what worries me is that they don't seem to have any inclination to stop that spending spree and so it's like the central banks are fighting against their own governments yeah try to control inflation and what worries me is that we're just going to live in a period of higher inflation you know 3 4% a year are you making not, money here? Sorry? Are you making money here? Oh, you, am I still sharing my screen? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can see the 10 years. You see here, they're going Yeah, yeah. okay. So I, I, you see this offer here at 22? Yeah. There's 1.9 trillion offer. I happen to be the first person in line to sell there. Okay. So I'm getting very small... Um, Orders, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Trades coming in, you know. You see what the bonds going, the, the bond prices. Oh, yeah, the bond prices are going up for some reason. Uh, right. It doesn't seem to be much going on in the U.S. Actually, they're going up, and oh, it's the stock market is really getting beaten up. Taking a dive here. Yeah. Right. Right. I don't know what's going on, but it's taking a beating here. Right. Anyway, so so uh, yeah, so. Uh, sorry. So I think that the fiscal spending of governments is worrisome because it doesn't look like they're going to stop. Uh, they seem to be like uh, on, especially in an election year in the U.S., that the Trudeau government just keeps announcing more and more spending, more deficit spending. That's very inflationary. Right. Right. And so the central bank is trying to cool inflation. The government is spending their ramping inflation up. And what worries me is that we're not going to make any headway on bringing inflation down. Hopefully it won't flare up again. And so we might be in a period of sort of longer rates for a longer time, higher rates for a longer time. A little bit higher. Now, is there a point in time, I guess, that the governments are also paying high interest on the yeah. amount that they're borrowing too, right? Yeah. It's, it's, they're, 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 it's, it's, they're suffering themselves too because they have to pay this interest. But, you know, they seem to be, uh, you know, I don't know. They seem to have this attitude that it's not their money and they don't really care. Like the U.S., the interest, the interest uh, on the U.S. debt this year will be higher than the uh, defense spending. Right. Which is huge. And in Canada, it's, it's really problematic. You know, it's really problematic because the Trudeau government, the liberals, absolutely ballooned our debt. Mm -hmm. They more than doubled it, you know. So now not only did they double their debt, but they are paying, you know, five, six percent on it. Right. A year. Right. Right. Which makes 
the deficit's even more and more every year. Right. So there could be a point in time if they cap the things that they're worried about that they have to lower rates just because they want to it could save be. on interest. It could, you know, if they can, be, there could be political pressure to lower rates uh, yeah. just to sort of keep the interest burden down. You know, right, um, right. But you know, inflation is the real killer to the people to, to all of us, right? right? That's what they that's what they don't want. They don't want a repeat of the seventies. Right. Where uh, you know your 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 cost of living dramatically goes up, right, and it just you know just weakens the entire economy at every at every level. Right, know? but they already have. I mean, even though we've gone inflation down to three percent, the cumulative effects of that since COVID, yeah, are huge. prices are prices are probably eighteen percent higher than they were in two thousand nineteen, across right. the board right now. Right. You know? Right. It was wage gains too. There was probably like a seven or eight percent cumulative wage gain, maybe yeah. even more. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, for sure. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, this has been uh, amazingly informative. I mean, uh, it looks like there's some action happening here. If you look at the chart, um, yeah. tomorrow, uh, April fifth, there's some jobs numbers. Then we'll yeah. have a Bank of Canada meeting next week, and there'll be inflation numbers you know, towards the end of the month, this month. So we kind of probably need a few weaker numbers over the next little while and maybe some of these prices change a bit, right? Yeah, we need we need a string of, you know, sort of, um, I guess like ideally in Canada would be that our eases would come off the back of easing inflation and not, uh, uh, you know, a, a real drop in GDP. Right. Jobs, right? Like ideally it would be a, a reversion to a 2% inflation rate. A job market is still good. The economy is still good and they could, they could, they could ease. Right. Right. You don't necessarily want an ease when um, the GDP is just crumbling. Right. Which I mean, they, they would do, but that would mean that we're actually in a recession, you know? Right. So, Right. Still find it amazing. I mean, you and I have had, uh, I'm yeah. going to let you go here, but you and I have had many conversations over scotch and and cigars that, you know, never thought we would get to these, you know, these interest rates, you know, 5% Absolutely. or 5 and a quarter and, and have done it so fast without, you know, a recession or the economy yeah. cratering. Yeah. Like, well, bravo to these, uh, bravo to, to both Macklin and um, Powell. Uh, you know, because they are really the first uh, central bankers in a long time that have the uh, guts to do what's needed to fight inflation. I mean, they're they're, they're also the first ones to really have to deal with it, but right. uh, they're really sticking to their guns and they're and they're really trying to normalize it. Right. They missed it, but at least they were dealt they dealt with. They it. missed it, but you know, it's you know, there's very serious lags to the economic data that you're presented with and and, yeah. and how your policy works, you know, right. uh, they would have been crucified if they started raising rates, you know, at the first sniff of inflation, you know, right, right, right. Well, yeah. uh, um, this has been amazing, Kevin. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, it's great talking to you. And uh, uh, I'm going to so call on you. I know I'm doing expert segment with other people, but I may periodically call on you if we see some movement from these kind of, Absolutely. Expectations maybe every couple of months or three, four months if we see some actual, you know, difference of opinions and some volatility and maybe some, you know, some some pressure on, you know, economic fundamentals in Canada. We'll come back and check in with you and see what you think at that point. Absolutely. I, I would love that. I, I love talking about this. I enjoy talking to you and I hope your viewers find it uh, uh, helpful. Yeah. I think we will. I think they will. And uh, again, I really appreciate it. Enjoy your weekend, continued uh, success in trading, and we'll uh, speak to you soon. All right. Okay, take care, Kevin. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.